He said they were building a yellow brick road to the top of Mount Everest, and the very mountain that propelled him into world notoriety was also the mountain that claimed the life of one of the great mountain guides of our time. American Scott Fisher, a born mountaineer, strong, confident, charismatic, humbled by the grandeur and beauty of the mountains, he was inspired to guide people to share in that experience. The untimely passing of Scott Fisher during the storm that claimed seven other lives has remained a topic of speculation and great interest to mountaineers, researchers, and enthusiasts alike. While many aspects of the event have been extensively documented, there still remains many unanswered questions. In today's video, we'll look at the loss of Scott Fisher and briefly examine some of the factors that claimed his life. First, I'll look at Scott Fisher's background and how he found himself in the world spotlight as a guide bringing tourist climbers to the top of Mount Everest, which was very new back in 1996. I'll give a brief overview of the extreme conditions and weather on Mount Everest. Then I'll describe the scene in 1996 and some of the key players who were there during that event. I'll discuss key moments and decisions that were made that led to the loss of lives. I'll offer some thoughts on critical errors that were made that led directly to Scott Fisher losing his life. And lastly, we'll discuss briefly the legacy and impact of Scott Fisher. This video is not intended to be a treatise or a full, complete examination to the storm of 1996 on Mount Everest. It's really a brief overview of Scott Fisher and some of the key decisions that led to his death on Mount Everest. For the full story, I suggest you read John Krakauer's Into Thin Air, Anatoly Bokriev's book called The Climb, and also the documentary Mountain Without Mercy, The Everest Story with Forrest Sawyer. It first aired in April of 1997. Before I go any further on this video, I hope you'll take a moment to subscribe and also consider becoming a member of this channel. You can support the work that I do on Everest Mystery so I can put out more videos like this. These videos I look to inspire and give you thought-provoking videos that make your life just a little bit better. So first, let's look at Scott Fisher's background and how he found himself on Mount Everest in 1996. Scott Fisher was born in 1955. He was known for his ascents of the highest mountains in the world without bottled oxygen. He was the first American, along with Wally Bird, to summit Lhotse, done without bottled oxygen. And also with Ed Viesters and Charlie Mace climbed K2, also without oxygen. In 1984, with two friends, Scott Fisher formed his company called Mountain Madness, which is still in existence today, guiding people on major mountains around the world. Fisher guided on numerous expeditions that were done primarily to raise money for organizations like the 1993 Climb for the Cure on Denali, which raised $280,000 for the American Cancer Foundation for AIDS research. And the company also removed 5,000 pounds of trash and 150 discarded oxygen bottles from Mount Everest. Perhaps the unparalleled string of successes for Fisher was what might have led him to a level of confidence in the belief that he could pull just about anything off. He certainly was a strong climber and had been involved in many rescues. In fact, his nickname was The Rescuer. Successes like that, even in the face of danger, can understandably give people a sense of immortality. It was as if perhaps he had dialed in the secret code to not only getting himself up Mount Everest, but for how to get other people with him to the top and back down safely again. Now on to a brief overview of the extreme conditions that one can expect on Mount Everest. A climber on an expedition to Mount Everest must ascend nearly five miles or eight kilometers above sea level. That's where commercial jets fly with pressurized cabins. At that altitude, you're breathing four times faster than normal. 
every single breath is painful and you're still starved for oxygen. In fact, your body is under so much duress and so much pressure that you are literally dying moment by moment. That's why they call that area above 26,000 feet or 8,000 meters the death zone. The weather is so bad on Mount Everest that it's only a short window of time, usually in the month of May, that the jet stream lifts up higher than the summit of Mount Everest, giving people an opportunity to get to the summit and back down again without being caught in extreme weather. Now let's describe the scene on the mountain in 1996 and introduce some of the key players who were there. Guiding people to the summit of Mount Everest was a dream come true for Scott Fisher. It was his first year guiding on Mount Everest. Mountain Madness had eight clients. They had eight Sherpas as well, and two guides, Neil Beidelman and Anatoly Bokriev. Scott, of course, himself was guiding. He was interviewed in base camp at the beginning of the expedition, which shows just how confident he was that there was gonna be nothing but success on the mountain. Honestly speaking, we have really learned how to climb Mount Everest and are building the yellow brick road to the top of Mount Everest. Fisher was said to be known for his freewheeling style, a kind of mountain climbing rock and roller summed up by his company's name, Mountain Madness. He had a lot to gain from getting his clients to the summit, and notably, he had with him socialite Sandy Pittman, who was there reporting for NBC with a satellite phone, a fax machine, and internet. She was making periodic updates directly to NBC. Fisher was a savvy businessman. He had every intention to getting her up to the top, knowing that if he did and everything was successful, he would be launched into world notoriety. Fisher's friend and rival was Rob Hall. He was also there that year. Hall had already guided somewhere in the neighborhood of 39 clients successfully to the summit of Mount Everest. He was leading a team again this year, and on his team was the journalist and author John Krakauer, who was writing a report for Outside Magazine. Another notable that was on Rob Hall's team was Dallas physician Beck Weathers. There's no doubt that having two high-profile journalists on the mountain was putting a lot of pressure on the teams that were there. The spotlight was on them. The pressure was really on to perform perfectly. Any mix-up was going to go just as far as any success. And we're familiar with human nature, no doubt. Ambition played a big part of this, where ego gets involved. It doesn't make anybody a bad person, but it does lead to some curious decision-making higher up on the mountain that had a dramatic impact later in the expedition, as you'll see. Also on the mountain was a film team led by David Brashears. He was leading a camera team from McGilvery Freeman Films to create the first giant screen movie on Everest. Climbing with Brashears was noted mountaineer from the United States, Ed Veasters. And Brashears literally said he was worried that all the amateurs on the mountain could make it dangerous for everyone. He said, you get a guide, you get some money, you climb Mount McKinley, and the next step is Everest, and they don't know any better. And there were a lot of amateurs to worry about. By early May, Everest Base Camp was a small village of over 300 people with 14 teams, which today, in today's day and age, seems like nothing. There were stereos, satellite telephones, fax machines, television sets, espresso makers. Everest had truly entered the beginning of the commercial age. So suddenly, Everest had become a worldwide spectator sport. Rob Hall and Scott Fisher had definitely had the most to gain. This was a marketing bonanza. It was a gigantic opportunity for Rob Hall and Scott Fisher to succeed. And that success included getting John Krakauer and Sandy Pittman to the summit and back down safely. Now on to the timeline of the storm. On May 4th, hoping to avoid a traffic jam on the mountain, there was a meeting in base camp of all the expedition leaders. Rob Hall was there, David Brashears, and Scott Fisher. And despite the rivalry of Hall and Fisher, it was decided that they would join forces on their summit bid for more safety, 
in numbers, if you will, and they were going to collaborate on fixing ropes on certain dangerous sections of the actual summit run above Camp 4. So they set out on May 6th, and in three days they found themselves at Camp 3. Camp 3 is halfway up or so the Lotse face, a very steep incline. There is no room for error there. It's located about 24,000 feet, maybe a little bit under, 7,300 meters. And the first ominous event of the expedition was that a climber from the Taiwanese expedition had taken a bad fall and his team leader, eager to get to the summit, decided to leave him behind in Camp 3 so he could get to the top and back down. That climber was Makalu Gao. David Bashir said in a quote, that event told me that there was a lot of raw ambition up there and not enough compassion. Four hours later, they learned that the gentleman from the Taiwanese expedition had died. And that, as David Bashir said, was the beginning of this whole tragedy. Scott Fisher and Rob Hall pressed forward to Camp 4 at 26,000 feet or 8,000 meters. This is the staging point for the summit. It's in the death zone. Camp 4 is a desolate, wind-blown place. There's no fun being there, and it's a graveyard. Sometimes, literally, there are bodies frozen there. It's too high to remove them. There are discarded oxygen bottles, ripped tents, food canisters, fuel canisters. And one of the most important things is that the climbers there are on oxygen. It's the only way to help keep the body warm, to keep the body and brain functioning, and to keep the brain particularly in a place where it can make somewhat logical decisions. In the death zone, the human brain literally begins to suffocate. Judgment is impaired, and there's no room for mistakes. Midnight on May 10th, the two teams, led by Scott Fisher and Rob Hall, strap on the oxygen tanks and headlamps and set out for the summit. It is cold, but it's crisp, and the sky is a blanket of stars. And it really seems like the perfect night for the teams to make it to the summit. Hall and Fisher had both set a turnaround time of 2 p.m. If you haven't made it to the summit by 2 p.m., absolutely mandatory. You must turn around and go back down. And the plan was that there was going to be a team of two Sherpas who were going to affix ropes to certain places on the climb going up toward the summit that were especially dangerous, where a fall would mean certain death. There's no question that the day's first critical mistakes are made right about here. One of the Sherpas on Fisher's team, Lopsang, very powerful climber, never shows up to fix the ropes. He's nowhere to be seen at the time. And because of that, the other Sherpa who was going to fix the ropes with Lopsang said he was not going to do it alone. Desperate to make a decision for what to do, Scott Fisher's guide, Neil Beidelman, decides to take up that job himself and begins fixing lines in the critical sections. But Beidelman estimates that at least a couple of hours time was lost. Now we're talking about a time where sometimes the matter of minutes can mean the difference between life and death. The explanation, what was found for Scott Fisher's Sherpa Lobsang, was that he had taken on a different mission. He was seen with someone in tow on a four-foot stretch of rope in a yellow down suit, hauling that person, quote, like a horse pulling a plow. The person he was hauling was none other than Scott Fisher's high-profile client, the woman who was filing reports on the internet, Sandy Pittman. For the first five or six hours, Pittman was being towed up the mountain. It was obvious that someone decided she needed to be short roped or else she would never get to the top. So what we have now is what possibly is the first ever traffic jam on Mount Everest. Nothing like happens in this day and age, but as each rope is fixed, there are delays and climbers move up to the back to wait for those ropes to be fixed. At 1.25 that afternoon, Neil Beidelman makes it to the summit of Mount Everest, but he's unsure what to do because he was told by Fisher that Fisher was the one who was going to make the decisions when the teams would head back down the mountain. Instead of a short photo opportunity on top, Beidelman spent an hour and 45 minutes at the top, staggering amount of time. 
And now for the second critical mistake of the day, the clients continued to summit, accumulating on the top, staying for an extended amount of time instead of turning to go back down. They were waiting for word from Fisher and they were savoring their success, but the 2 p.m. turnaround time had long since passed. At 3.10 p.m., Beidelman finally makes the decision to go back down the mountain, starts the clients down, and they soon pass Scott Fisher, who's very weak, but still pressing for the summit. Why he didn't turn around to descend at that time with his clients, one may never know. It was 3.45 p.m. when Scott Fisher finally summited weak, and by the look of this photograph, it shows that ominous clouds are gathering just below the climbers. John Krakauer literally said, I'm very scared and taking it seriously and want to get down in a hurry, and pretty soon I descend into the storm. And in the space of several minutes, the wind just comes in like a freight train. I mean, it's really blowing. It's very, very cold and turns into a whiteout. You can't really tell where the ridge ends and the cloud begins. It'd be very easy just to walk off this ridge. And meanwhile, Rob Hall was still on the summit with his client, Doug Hansen. Took him a very long time to reach the top and very near the summit, Hansen collapsed. And at which time, Rob Hall called down to base camp just below the summit. Rob asked for help, saying he and Doug had both run out of oxygen and that Doug was in trouble. We need help. And to make things worse, Scott Fisher, who had been fatigued and climbing all day, is near complete exhaustion and about to collapse himself. When asked about how quickly the storm came in, David Brashears, with decades of Everest experience, said, we're 5,000 feet away, and 5,000 feet away on Everest at those elevations, you might as well be trying to rescue the people in Apollo 13. A little bit below the area known as the balcony on Mount Everest, which is about halfway between the summit and the high camp, Scott Fisher's friend and climbing partner, Lobsang, tries to rescue him. And just as Lobsang had tried to tow Sandy Pittman up the mountain, he tried the same by dragging Fisher downward. And he said that he tied him with the rope, started dragging him. The weather was so bad, he couldn't move him at all. And in the ensuing hours, Beidelman would collect all his strength to rally an hysterical Sandy Pittman to keep moving. It was a desperate scene up there, and most people had no clue what to do. Thankfully for Neil Beidelman and Anatoly Bokriev, many lives that could have been lost were saved. Beidelman worked feverishly into the night to keep his exhausted clients moving, and by nightfall, he had pulled together a group of seven, including Beck Weathers and Sandy Pittman. All of them were out of bottled oxygen in the middle of a freezing hurricane, completely lost, away from Camp 4, not knowing what to do. The winds were howling, the wind chill was 60 or 70 below, and does it even matter if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius? And in the hours that followed, as the team was trying to find its way to camp, Bokriev finds Beidelman and literally risks his life on several occasions to go retrieve climbers and bring them back to tents. And he determined at the time that Beck Weathers wasn't even worth the effort and he was left for dead. The following day, Scott Fisher is missing. A rescue team heads up into life-threatening conditions to find him hours later. They report back that Scott has died. They said they watched his chest for any motion at all. They tried to feed him soup and that he hadn't even closed his eyes and his teeth were clenched. Exhaustion, high altitude, and cold had overcome the powerful Scott Fisher. And now for my closing thoughts on the tragedy of 1996 and Scott Fisher's death. It's interesting to note that other than Scott Fisher himself, nobody on his team died. 
One critical error that was made was that Scott was doing everything he could to personally escort legendary mountaineer Pete Schoening, who at the time was 68 years old. Pete Schoening was known for an absolutely miraculous belay on K2 in 1953 that saved seven lives. That ice axe that Pete Schoening used is in the Museum of the American Alpine Club. It was said that Fisher poured a lot of resources into taking care of Shoning, more or less babysitting him, running back and forth, and expending a lot of energy that he could have used elsewhere. Another critical mistake that was made was that before the summit rotation, Bokoriev himself went down to a village called Ferache, which is much lower in elevation, spent time relaxing in the sun, having a shower, sleeping in the lower air of altitude. And during that time, Fisher wasn't keeping his own acclimatization schedule. He was ignoring it. He stayed at base camp. Perhaps in Scott's mind, he's thinking, I'm gonna get the oldest man on top of Mount Everest and they're going to soon carve my name in stone and I'm going to be the guy who did that. A third critical error of Scott's, which might not have been easy to understand before the expedition, is that he had several weak clients, Sandy Pittman being among them, 68-year-old Pete Schoening, understandably at that age, it's a different thing that we're dealing with. And also his friend Dale Cruz, a dentist who was sick at Camp 2, and instead of Fisher having him sent back down with a Sherpa on his team, Fisher himself went all the way back down to base camp, apparently had a beer down there, and then went back up to Camp 2 to meet his team before moving up for the summit bid. That's a lot of energy to go all the way down to base camp and back up when you can be resting and saving everything for the summit bid. It looks like Scott Fisher's niceness and his desire to be involved in every aspect of taking care of his clients, which is an admirable thing indeed, was what cost him his life. He was spending so much time attending to the needs of Cruz and Shoning and making sure that Pittman was taken care of by Lopsang that he had nothing left for himself. Not unlike Rob Hall with his client Doug Hansen, Scott Fisher paid the ultimate price on Mount Everest. One thing to consider is that at the time, there was really nothing to base this experience on. No team had encountered such incredible conditions before, at least in terms of being a commercial team. And so Fisher and Hall perhaps were deluded into thinking that they would be able to overcome any of these obstacles given the strength of their guides and the Sherpa staff that they had assembled with them. So by the time Scott Fisher got to Camp 4 with his team, he was already severely depleted in terms of energy. And after that, one has to understand he's in the death zone, as are all the people up there. And you almost can't even blame a person for making poor choices and bad decisions up there. In the death zone, your body is operating on a different level as is your brain. So he clearly wasn't thinking. And since nobody had ever had to before, nobody's thinking about, I wonder how Scott's doing. A team is only as fast as their weakest link. Clearly Sandy Pittman was a major liability, but so was Scott Fisher in terms of him being a nice guy, for him to be over attentive to all the needs of the clients, as I had mentioned before. He was motivated by his ambitions, which I at least can personally understand. I think anybody can. It's a human thing to want to achieve great things, especially when the world is watching. Perhaps the allure of making it big, being the guide was what pulled him up to the top of Everest on that fateful day. The ultimate question is, can we learn anything from this story or has anything been learned from this story? One would think that given a story like this, that the numbers on Everest would go down, but on the contrary, the numbers have done nothing but gone up and up and up. So lastly, how does this impact the legacy of Scott Fisher? Well, no doubt, Scott Fisher was a good man, an ambitious businessman, talented, strong, charismatic, but he was caught up in his own desire to grow his company. That combined with the freak appearance of a deadly storm was all that it took to take Scott Fisher's life. So while some questions can never be fully answered, 
continued dialogue and research into these events surrounding Scott Fisher's death on Mount Everest hopefully can contribute to a greater understanding of ourselves for future mountaineers and people endeavoring to do anything as difficult as climbing Mount Everest. I'd love to know what your thoughts are about this story. If I've left any key details out, please put them in the comments and let me know also in the comments what you think about this story, if it means anything to you, if you remember where you were when it happened or the first time you heard about the 1996 storm. I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Take time to do a kind deed for somebody that you don't know. Don't ask for anything in return. Make the world a better place one step at a time. Thanks for being here.